All right, well, welcome to the Appalachian Cultural Center. We are thrilled with this spring's focus on our celebration of Latin and Hispanic voices. Our first participant in that celebration is Professor Michael Giles, who's a Venezuelan American, uh, who's gracing us with his paintings and is going to talk to us about their construction and their creation, uh, the influences that he had by Gabriel Garcia Marquez um, from Colombia, uh, also, but passed away in Mexico. I think he lived in Mexico the last 30 years of his life. Nice. Um, so it is an honor to introduce you to Michael Giles, but also to my wonderful colleague and many of your professors, Professor Heather Hartman Fultz, who has worked with Professor Giles and will be doing a brief introduction as well. So welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. It is my pleasure to introduce um, our guest speaker today, artist Michael Giles. So uh, Michael Giles has exhibited um, nationally in places such as Site Brooklyn in Brooklyn, New York, um, Core New Art Space in Denver, Colorado, as well as the William King Museum in Abington, Virginia, Channel to Channel Gallery in Nashville, as well as um, other regional exhibitions here in Tennessee. Um, he earned his uh, BFA from Ohio State University and then his MFA from the University of Tennessee, which is how I uh, first encountered him. So we were actually in grad school together. Yes. Um, and he teaches at Lincoln Memorial University. So it is my pleasure to um, introduce him and to get this lecture started. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I was uh, not sure what to expect. Three people, no people. Uh, I'm glad to see there's a lot of people here. So that, uh, I do appreciate you coming out. Um, as, uh, as Jennifer and Heather stated, um, you know, I, I am uh, originally uh, born in Venezuela. Uh, uh, too many years ago now, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Uh, how long ago that's been. Um, we, uh, I was born there, I uh, was there, lived there for about five years, and we, we emigrated to uh, Ohio, of all places. Um, uh, my, one of my aunts was actually at grad school in Ohio, at Ohio University, so we went up to be with her for a little bit, and uh, we stayed in Ohio. Um, so I grew up in a little town, tiny town, little farm town in Ohio, uh, called Baltimore. Um, you know, just uh, 3,000 people, I think, is, uh, is all the Westerners do. We always. Uh, brag about how many few people we have in our, in our graduating <laughs> classes. We had 83 in my graduating class. So, um, so yes, yeah, a small town and grew up there. Um, and um, yeah, I, I went to Ohio State for my undergrad, as, as she stated, uh, lived in Chicago for a while, came to Tennessee for grad school for three years, um, but met a Tennessee girl and I'm still here so many years later. <laughs> so it's been, uh, it's been my, my ride throughout, the, uh, you know, throughout the, the Americas, so to speak. Um, so, um, you know, uh, that has kind of influenced in a lot of ways, uh, but, you know, growing up in the United States as a, uh, you know, Venezuelan American. Um, you know, I, I remember, I, I think I was maybe 12 years old when I realized that my friends' families didn't speak Spanish at home. You know, I figured everyone spoke Spanish at home, we just spoke English outside. You know, so it was this whole, uh, you know, living in two, with your feet in two, in two lands in a way, uh, you know, figuring that out on top of that, you know, you're also, I was also the, uh, the, the, the skateboarding punk rock kid in school, there's about four of us, you know, in a small rural town, you know, we were the, always the outcast in so many ways. Um, and that kind of influenced me in terms of, uh, you know, my creative processes, you know, I, I was always uh, into drawing and making, um, it, uh, since I was a kid, I always remember always drawing. You know, my, my, my father would bring home these stacks of uh, the old computer papers, which are, none of you remember this because you're all so young, but the, <laughs> the old computer papers that were just uh, bound together, and I would just go through those and draw on them all, you know, all weekend long, he'd bring me more the next week, and we, I would just do that all the time. And that's kind of how my process started um, as I became an artist. Uh, you know, Ohio State, uh, making art throughout my, my college years, throughout my, my, my younger years, and continuing to this day, still making art. Um, it's been the, the, the mainstay of my life, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, I always ask myself sometimes, why, why do you make art? Well, it's, you know, it's the only thing I'm kind of good at, I guess. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's, that, 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 that's kept me going for a long time there. So this body of work, uh, is a newer kind of uh, body of work, which, uh, as stated before, has been influenced by the um, 
by the work of um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, 100 Years of Solitude. This is this book here, um, which I am uh, I'm working from. So the importance of the book in, in and of itself, um, it, it's, it's one of the seminal texts of Latin American literature uh, of the 20th century. It's, uh, you know, he's, he's a, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winner. Um, it, it's, it tells a very kind of a basic story of magical realism that kind of encompasses the history of Latin America as I interpreted it and received it from my parents. Uh, my parents were, uh, you know, I said that we emigra they immigrated from, uh, from Venezuela um, when they were young. They were in their 20s, uh, mid-20s when they, when, they, when they emigrated. And um, my connection to Venezuela was really the stories they told us. You know, the stories they told me about Venezuela, the stories they told me about Latin America, you know, um, how do you, uh, you know, figure out the, 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 the presence of Latin America when you're growing up in the United States in the 80s, you know, when you've got, it's, you know, it's all Rocky and Rambo movies and, you know, and, uh, you know, all, all this very kind of an 80s um, hyper Americanness. Um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you navigate those two spaces? You know, it was these stories that they, they told me about the, 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 the visions of Latin America, the, the richness of the, of the countries, yet the, uh, the continual um, economic, insta economic and political instability in the countries, um, all these things, you know, um, in the middle of, you know, of, the, of the yuppie 80s uh, with, with the high rising stock markets and all these things. Um, you know, how do you make sense of that as a kid, you know, which you, where you don't understand so much. All you're seeing is the nightly news sometimes and you're seeing um, information that's given to you through television and through pop culture. Um, so one of the things that resonated to me about this book was that, that the same stories that my parents told me, I could see them in this book. That makes sense, of course. My parents, once again, uh, you know, they, they, were, uh, they would have been uh, early teenagers when this book came out. Um, this is a book that they would have read in probably in their late teens and early 20s. Um, this is the, the, the book that they would have um, had a, a connection to. These are the stories uh, that we tell ourselves that we, we have in Latin America. So um, that became an important aspect to me when I started finally reading this book, um, that it, it connected me to those stories that I had been told. Um, you know, and I got to this book late in life. I, I didn't really pick it up until I was in my 30s um, and started to read it. So this book became important in that sense. Um, I started actually, got, I got into this book as I, I was working um, one of my many side jobs as an adjunct professor, as I'm sure uh, <laughs> uh, Heather can attest to that, that kind of work and all you other professors who maybe did the adjunct gig for a while can also attest to. You've always got a second, maybe a third job as well as teaching two classes at two different universities and colleges, et cetera. Um, I was working at a job uh, at Jewelry TV. I don't know if you all are familiar with Jewelry TV, um, but I was working there taking orders for people's rings and uh, earrings and what have you, but you couldn't have any kind of uh, phone on the, on the sales floor. You, you couldn't have any kind of electronics. All you, all you could do was read books. Um, so I, I was reading this book one time and I was like, whoa, I'm really connecting to it. I'm really connecting to it. I, I, I felt that I wanted to do something with this book. How can I, how can I use this book to, to, to tell a story, maybe, to, to at least use it as an impetus to, to make art? And that was, uh, that was uh, at a time right then when my artwork was transforming as well. That was around a time when I was starting to get back into abstraction. I had dabbled in abstraction in the past before, but I had always uh, primarily did figurative work. Um, you know, I had primarily done, done figurative work throughout my life. Uh, you know, uh, maybe rem you remember, Heather, my, my, my final show was these, these giant drawings of, you know, of punk rock bands and, uh, and family members and things of that nature. So I had always done figurative work. But one of the things I found with the figurative work at the time, but before I started going into abstraction again, I started to make kind of work that was um, politically relevant. I was trying to make work that talked about politics, talked about the work around us, talked about the world around us. What I found was that I kept focusing on the negative aspects of the world and the news around me. So I kept making work that was kind of depressing me all the time. I was going in my studio. I got to the point where I was going to my studio and not enjoying myself. 
I was totally not enjoying anything I was doing because it was just depressing me. I was lo looking over news stories from Latin America and the, the, the turbulence going on with, uh, at that point, um, the turbulence in Venezuela with, with the, the transition from Chavez to Maduro, the, the transition, this is the time of the Arab Spring, you know, I was looking at uh, all that. There, there was, seemed to be such high hopes, but there was also a lot of terrible things happening throughout the world. And I was kind of uh, incorporating that into my work and depressing myself. And I, I thought, how can you keep doing this? This is not, it's not making you happy as an artist, as a person. What do you want to do? You know, you need to change something here to make this enjoyable. That's when I came to the realization, I just wanted to paint again. I wanted to literally just put material onto a surface. You know, I wanted to paint again. I wanted to be uh, an artist again. And I just, I wanted to do that basic thing that I really enjoy so much is putting material onto a canvas. I started doing some really not good <laughs> abstract paintings at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell my students, you gotta get the bad ones out before you, the, the good ones come. So you gotta work, just, just keep making them, keep making them. So I kept doing that. And I started to come to the realization one day that you know, that wasn't working. I needed something to get me past that idea. Oftentimes with an abstraction and with an abstract art, um, you come up to this place where you want to try to resolve it right off the bat. What does it mean? What is its impetus? What, where does it come from? And what's it go, where is it going all at once? I had to find a way to get around that. I had to find a place to just make, just do. And that's when this book kind of came into, reading this book on that sales floor at Jewelry TV came into it. I started to really um, think about and look at the spaces between the words as a scaffolding. I brought the book with me, not just to, to show off that I own a book, but, um, <laughs> but, I was, but you can see here on this page, I was starting, sometimes when you're reading, I, I, you know, maybe me being a visual, overly visual person, I started to notice the spaces between the words, sometimes go between sentences, and I, that started to me to, whoa, these are patterns that are happening. I'm starting to see these um, areas um, the spaces between the paragraphs that become pattern, that become a place. I thought to myself, oh, what if I took those patterns, put them onto a piece of paper or onto a canvas, and used that as a place to start painting from? Oh, I can stop thinking all of a sudden, which is what I need to do sometimes as, an, as a painter. You gotta stop thinking and start doing, right? So if you, you don't think too much, you start, start to make and you can figure it out later. That, that was what began this, these, this project, uh, which I've been working on at this point now for about uh, seven years or so. Uh, we're going on, well, about six years, give or take, when, when, when I start to uh, really think about it. Six to seven years, I started, I've been working on this kind of project with, with, these, with these paintings and this book. Um, so that's the scaffolding that I have, right? That, that's this, these, this book becomes the grid, the scaffolding for these images. So all these, um, all these marks become, come from the book. All of these marks come from the book. And after I get that put onto, the, onto this surface, I can start to worry about painterly concerns. What I, what I want to think about when I work with my painting, which is really about this materiality, um, getting to the point where I can put paint onto a surface, thinking outside of myself, thinking outside of, of the overarching concepts of the work, start to really just concentrate on putting material onto a surface. So it becomes about the, this, these mixtures of, of colors, these mixtures of material, spray paint with thick paint with thinner paint. Um, look here on this, uh, on this uh, piece here, um, this watercolor piece where I've got ink and writing um, and, and thick glossy areas with, uh, combined with uh, very dull areas, um, bright garish colors next to these uh, more dull gold colors. Um, the, the really it becomes about making these, um, these, these paintings as a means of translating this, the pages of this book into a painting. Um, so that is basically, you know, that's basically what I'm starting to think about my ideas, how I'm starting to work on these paintings, how they're starting to be constructed. So we can see in all these works here, once again, 
whenever you see these kind of large areas, these kind of large marks, those are going to typically be from the book where I find these spaces in the book. And that's because of my scaffolding. That becomes then when I start to worry about, OK, this one here connects to this corner. I can draw a line and make a line. I can start to worry about putting color and different kinds of material onto a surface, uh, thinking about how do the colors intersect and interact, starting to build a new kind of concept um, for this book, from, uh, for these paintings that comes from the pages of this book. So it, it is this kind, of a, this kind of a dual track of meaning in a way to, to me. Uh, the meaning of the book itself, personal perhaps, uh, directly to me, it's, it really comes about the, this idea of, of connecting with these histories that I, that I talked about. Um, but it, on the same time, it also becomes about these kind of more formal painterly concerns. Uh, ideas about, about color, ideas about shape, ideas about um, materiality, you know, thick, you know, all these things that we think about when we start painting, the thick paint and the thin paint, um, the glossiness versus the dullness, you know, uh, where do I scrape things, where do I leave things, where do I, how, do, how does a, um, a material such as, a, excuse me, you know, if we start thinking about, um, this is most more of the later work, the busyness of the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the surface, where we still see where we, I let, I let the, um, the pencil marks show on, this, on these surfaces. We have uh, surfaces mixed with wax and uh, surfaces that are mixed with, uh, with uh, a, a, um, a glossy um, um, liquid on here so that, so that it makes it shiny against the dullness of itself. Uh, mixing, um, you know, this has, this has acrylic paint as well in it, involved in it. And oftentimes I'll start now with acrylic as a base of, of these things. Um, finding ways to start to play around with um, colored pencil and charcoal and paint together uh, to make a, a composition that, that becomes of interest, that brings some kind of a visual interest to the, to the viewer, hopefully, as they look onto these. You know, finding, finding the spaces to, to, to do the, I was going to say shocking, but I'm not so sure it's shocking, but at least it's the, uh, uh, the, 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 the stroke of, uh, you know, this is, a, uh, this is a drawing that I, I was sitting on for, for two weeks in my studio. I kept looking at it. I wasn't sure what was wrong with it until I was like, oh, you know, I just needed to put some spray paint on it. Just, so I just spray painted it. And then I was like, oh, well, that was simple. So I got to go home, right? So I, I was able to leave then finally. So, uh, you know, all, all of these uh, are, are the attributes that we get as a, as a painter as we work. Um, which brings me also to this, I, this idea that, um, about the meaning of this work. You know, this idea of what does it mean. Um, you know, I'm working from this text, which is, which is a, you know, a celebrated text, um, but I'm not really necessarily using it as a means of illustration. I'm not trying to tell this story. You know, this story has been told by a Nobel Prize winner. He can tell that story very well. He did a very good job himself telling that story. I'm interacting with that story. And these paintings become that part of that interaction, um, which gets me to that point of, of the idea of what is meaning in art, what is meaning in abstraction, especially. You know, uh, I could have illustrated the story. I could have just you know gone chapter by chapter, made a you know get, got my image of, of Melquiades, got my image of the Colonel, and ma ma made the story. Um, but that's not what I'm looking for. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to be the the, the comic illustrator of this book. I'm trying to interact with it find my own kind of way of, of visualizing it for myself and putting it out here for you to kind of visualize for yourself. Now, you may have no idea what this book's about, and that's fine. Maybe you'll go and read it, maybe you won't, um, but you're gonna bring something to it. You're gonna know, at the very least, from this talk, and maybe if you read the uh, artist statement that this is a book that has it's important in Latin American history. Uh, I'm Latin American, so okay, it's, it's, it's kind of a personal idea, and then you're gonna find a new way of interacting with that. That is kind of a, where, I, I, where I come to my, the, the conceptual uh, ideas I have about what is this idea of art and what is this idea of meaning that we find. Um, I read a text a few, uh, you know, I mean, maybe 10, 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15, I don't know. It, <laughs> At a certain point in your life, you just start losing track of what these years are and mean anyway. Uh, a while back, I was reading this text by uh, Gilles Deleuze, a, uh, a, um, a French philosopher, where he was talking about this idea of the becoming. The becoming to him, as he calls it, is this place where we find meaning. Um, he's thinking about linguistics, thinking about words, thinking about how we actually experience the idea of meaning. For example, 
Um, we all know what a wasp is, right? So we say wasp, we know what a wasp, we have an idea of what that is. But the word wasp itself doesn't mean much unless you know what the meaning of the word fly is, you know what the meaning of the word sting is. That gives you a truer meaning of the word wasp than any definition of in the, in the dictionary of an insect, a blah, blah, blah. No, we all know viscerally this is an, a, a thing that flies, it stings, and they're mean, right? And then they will come after you, right? So that is a truer meaning. The true meaning of the word wasp lies somewhere in between those three words. In between wasp, in between fly, in between sting. That's a true meaning of, of the word wasp. And I think maybe with art, with abstract art, we have to give ourselves that space to find that meaning. The true meaning of any of these drawings or paintings really lies between my making them, my ideas, what I put forward, what I put on here, and then that is being transmitted to the viewer, to you. Somewhere in there, and then between you and that painting, there's going to be a, a new meaning that comes along, a new meaning that, come, that happens. Uh, whether you know a lot about this book or not, whether you then use that as an impetus to learn more about this book, that may change your idea of the meaning of it. And that's where I come to in, in, in these pieces and why I keep making these abstract works. I, I find that um, they give me a space to maybe put something out there that's a little bit uh, more esoteric. It's a little bit more ephemeral in a, in a sense, but it, it, it maybe it gives us a place to interact with it um, in a much freer way than if I would have, for example, gone ahead and just illustrated the story of this book. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes I find that uh, you know, with uh, figurative work, it can become too straightforward. Um, you know, images of people together, images of you know, objects and persons, they become too quickly real and too quickly moved on from, which I think sometimes abstraction allows us a space to maybe um, have more of that freedom. Um, you know, I'm not trying to denigrate any figurative painters here at all. Trust, I also still do figurative work. Uh, I'm working on a few in my studio right now. Um, but, um, you know, this is the, this is the place where I, I kind of feel that I'm most comfortable right now in terms of working, in terms of finding the space that we can um, start to uh, find a new idea um, in between the space, between that painting and yourself, between myself and you and that painting. In that triangulation there, I think there's something but hopefully we get out of it. That's kind of what I've got for you. When the painting is happening, it really is about the, um, the interaction of that painting at that point. You know, it, it is about um, working on um, th those issues that come with that painting. Um, you know, when I start to put, you know, put the grids down, when I start to, uh, to, to think about which spaces I want to really bring attention to, which ones I'm going to play with, uh, with, with, with pencil or with paint or with white or with red. Those questions all happen individually in the painting itself. You know, the, the, the book itself really um, becomes, you know, as I said, I think it becomes a scaffolding upon which um, I, I use it as a means to start a painting. You know, I think that is one of the hardest parts really about uh, working with, um, at least it was for me for a long time, um, working with abstraction is how do you start that painting? How, how do you, you know, what, what is, you know, if, if, I, if I'm making still life paintings, I just set up a still life. I put some, some, some oranges and some cups and some stuff and, and I paint those directly, that, that's easy. Um, this gave me that kind of sense, that same sense of ease, um, using that, that the, the, the book as a scaffolding, you know. Um, and actually, this is, you know, this is volume two. This is my second book that I'm working from, as I said, because, you know, each, uh, each volume is different because, the pages are bigger, so the typeset, the way they're typeset, so each page is separate, you know, different from this version to the other version I had. So they're going to be, there's going to be new, you know, page 169 and this one is not going to be the same as 169 in the other book because the other one was smaller. So I'm, it's going to be scrunched up differently and it all becomes different in that sense. So in a lot of ways, it, it gives me that, that, that ease of starting a painting. It's amazing. Coming from, from this original structure, as you can see. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, because, you know, once again, all, all these pages are different. And, you know, um, I, I've found that sometimes when you're looking at these, uh, sometimes I, I think to myself, oh, that looks great. And I, and, I, and I make my little marks and I make my circles and I, I, I got it tabulated. And 
sometimes I go back and like, why was that interesting to me that day? You know, I, what was I thinking? You know, and, and that's some, I just don't end up using it. But you know, you you want to go through and um, there's a lot of pages in these books. And not all of them are going to be of interest, you know, visually. I, I kind of scan through them. Sometimes I, I sometimes I'll read it, start reading a chapter to get myself into the flow of it and start to see things, um, you know, and see what I find. Um, and it's not necessarily that it's always going to be, you know, not everything is going to be translated onto a, onto a canvas or even onto a large, larger paper. Can you talk about the grids that you use? Because kind of, I noticed that the, the sizing of the grids is different on all of them. Is, there, is that related to what's happening in the book? Yes. So, um, as... as so many artists are we are gluttons for punishment. Um, these other works, so just a, as, a, as a general sense, these are earlier works, and these here in this this section of the other gallery are the the newest work. This is the uh, the, the work that's kind of the over the last year year and a half or so. Um, I would take these these marks, right, and just eyeball them when I was doing the earlier work. I would just you know kind of. Uh, Make, give myself a sense of, uh, okay, this is going to look most nicely on this page. So I was making a decision right off the bat. These pieces here, I, uh, the grid became much more strongly emphasized. Um, it, uh, as I said, we're glutton for punishments. I, started, I decided to myself, I want to figure out what the, um, what the average of spaces and marks are on this, what the average of lines are on a page. So I, I, I sat there, yeah, and I sat there and counted letters across the page so I can get a basis, I find an average. I, just, I did the lines, and I got an of the lines. So then I had, uh, what, what is it exactly, I forget. Um, basically it's 50, I came up with the, most lines carried about 56 characters. And there are about 70 lines. So then, yeah. So then, the, the, the so then what happens is then I start to divide things into 56 sections, oh. divide into 70 sections, and then I start make, and I start drawing lines with a ruler across these things. And uh, because you know I don't have enough work to do as is uh, with a full-time job and a wife and a child and my art and you know. So uh, yeah, I, I give myself more work uh, for something that I end up then painting over. So you can, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's this. Yeah, it, it, yeah. The, so the grid has become a bit more, um, a bit more um, dictated from the beginning in terms of uh, standardized. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I've, got, you know, I've got a list here of, uh, you know, on canvases, the large ones will be 70 inches by 56 inches. I haven't had the the heart to make one of those yet, or the um, stamina yet to make one of the bigger ones. But these smaller ones also happen to be the, the 28 by 35, which meant that I had to, I can't buy a pre-made canvas any longer. I used to, these other ones are 30 by 40, as you see in there, which actually you can, you can buy those pre-made in a store. Now I've got to actually build them and stretch them myself. So yeah, I, I, you know, always finding new ways to make myself work more um, for um, not a, uh, I don't know, maybe, it, maybe it's worth it, but uh, maybe it's not. Uh, but that's what I'm doing right now anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, you know, sometimes artists, we, we do try to find ways to, I don't know, we're, 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 we're hands-on people, I guess, uh, in a lot of ways. So this keeps me more hands-on in that sense.